Welcome. Thank you so much for being here. Um, we're going to try and make this session obviously a conversation, and you're going to hear about this really fantastic book and Paolo's process in unearthing these histories around the um, authors, the secret authors um, of this fabulous work, but also because Paolo and I both have um, uh, a belief in popular pedagogy and participation, we may, you know, bring the conversation in and out at different times, you know, so we may not just have like a half hour of us and then a half hour of you, but really trying to build in as much conversation, as many of your thoughts and threads as possible. Is that okay? Yes. Yeah? Awesome. So um, just shout out some of your um, favorite uh, tales or stories from the Thousand and One Nights or ones that you know best. Alibaba. Alibaba. What else? Aladdin. Aladdin. The Frame Story. Shahrazad Story. The Frame Story, yeah. yeah. Shahrazad. Yes. <laughs> Anything else? Any of your other favorite tales? Sinbad? Sinbad. Sinbad. Okay, Sinbad. excellent. Yeah. Yes. So all... Hmm? Alibaba. More Alibaba. Great. Okay. <laughs> Super. So yeah, these are ancient tales that have traveled over time, over multiple continents. And Paolo has done a really, really fabulous um, service, but also um, a, a gripping book about the different translators over time who have um, put these stories together. And then again, as, as the title says, the secret authors. So I would like to start with um, your process of unearthing what you talk about in the book is uh, orphan tales, these tales that don't have um, an original kind of Arabic or Persian root, but have come to be some of these most popular and um, favorite tales. And talk a little bit about the relationship of these tales to the construction of Thousand One Nights as we know it, and, and who, who wrote them? How did they come to be? Thank you, Kehan. Um, so, how many of you know the story of Aladdin? Show and Alibaba, the Disney version, you know. It's, uh, it's different. I, I'd say, I'd, well, let's see if that counts. Um, here's the thing Alibaba and the Forty Thieves, Aladdin and the Wonderful Lamp, do not have texts in Arabic. They do not exist in the original, so to speak. And my book is a whodunit. Uh, one of my colleagues accused me of writing in a kind of Dan Brown style. <laughs> but as fate would have it, actually my research did take me to a, a discovery of a, a secret manuscript in the Vatican Library, so <laughs> I'll take it as a compliment. Um, basically what I was trying to figure out, these are the oldest stories that I remember hearing from my mother, who was an orphan from the north of Brazil. Uh, uh, the Oregonites was the first book she had received as a child from her adoptive father when she was about eight years old. And these stories were hardwired into my childhood, into my brain. And when I found out that they didn't exist in Arabic, I, I figured out I have to go out and I have to figure out how exactly were they added. They were added in French in the first European translation of the Arabian Nights. So the sort of Harry Potter of its day in Paris in 1709 uh, were the Arabian Nights tales. The publishing was a phenomenon. I came out on 12 volumes. People were as excited about these volumes appearing as a Harry Potter novel today. And um, it's in, the, in these French translations of the Arabian Nights that these stories first appeared. Alibaba and the Forty Thieves, Aladdin and the Wonderful Lamp. Also, Prince Ahmad and the Fairy Banu, which is the, this, the uh, basis for the first animated film ever, The Adventures of Prince Ahmad by Lotte Reininger, the woman who invented animated film in 1926 in Germany film that we should, I think, think more about. So all these stories were added in that French translation, and I had to figure out how were they actually, um, how did they become part of the Arabian Nights? That was really my, my quest. Um, because for, for so long, we've given all the credit to the translators. So these are often uh, Indiana Jones types. I, I, I don't mean this just as a metaphor. Uh, Richard Burton, the uh, English translator, the Victorian translator, of the Arabian Nights is one of the uh, real life models for uh, Indiana Jones. And these sort of imperialist uh, adventurers and explorers, I know you can hear at this uh, event about the exploration of the North Pole. Well, some of the uh, 18th and 19th century travelers and explorers to the Middle East were credited, really, almost like the Grimm's brothers, with having collected these stories from the Middle East. And because the stories did not have a lot of uh, high literary value in their culture of origin, right, in the Arabic-speaking world. 
uh, we've uh, erroneously given these, uh, these explorers and these adventurers the, the role of author of the Arabian Nights. So there are many books, the scholarly books that have been written about the first translator of the Arabian Nights into French, Antoine Galland, from 300 years ago, the creator of the Arabian Nights, the inventor of the Arabian Nights, the author of the Arabian Nights. And in a way it's true because um, he did add Ali Baba and Aladdin and Prince Ahmad to the canon of the Arabian Nights stories. But my role was to really unearth where did they get these stories from, right? They, and, and, and for too long, they've been given credit as the authors of the Arabian Nights, and I was trying to excavate the secret authors of, of the Arabian Nights. Uh, don't keep us in this suspense any longer. <laughs> Who is it? <laughs> so uh, when Antoine Gallon in 1709, he was uh, um, in his 70s when he translated the Arabian Nights, he was trying to regain the glories of his youth and his, uh, as, as a youth, he had served as secretary to the ambassador in Constantinople. And he had had a very prestigious life in the Levant, and he had collected books. Uh, originally, he went uh, to collect books in Arabic and Greek and, and, and Latin. Um, so when he was translating the Arabian Nights stories, uh, he ran into a, a minor problem. How many, how many nights is Shahrazad supposed to survive? Does anybody remember? Yeah, yes. How was it? Excuse me? 1001. 1001, right? It's almost, it's almost infinity, right? Because the idea is like a thousand being the biggest number you can think of, plus one. And she had to do this, this, this storytelling every night, because what happened if her story was not engaging enough for King Shariar? She and her sister, you know, would quickly die, and hence the other royal women of the kingdom, right? So Antoine Galland, uh, trying to recover the lost uh, success and access to the court in Versailles of his youth, had an incredible success translating his Arabic manuscript, but it ended in night 282. <laughs> so, does anybody care to guess what he was going to do? Was he going to come out with something called the 282 nights? <laughs> how, would, how would he fill in the rest? He'd write his own story. He would write his own story, anybody else? He divides them all up. Like Sinbad. Divide them up. <laughs> did he, did he, what some take, yeah. he added Sinbad, and there were seven voyages of Sinbad. Yeah. It was like each voyage is three nights. That's 21 nights right there. <laughs> <laughs> so that, that's certainly part of what he did. And what he didn't do is acknowledge that Sinbad was originally in a different story collection, which he kind of copy and pasted from. But at least Sinbad existed in an Arabic original that we can now look up in what was the King's Library. Now it's the National Library in, in Paris. In the case of Ali Baba, and, and Aladdin, uh, he does not acknowledge that where he took these stories from. He just publishes them as if he had an Arabic original for, uh, for them. But in his Parisian private diary, there he says that a storyteller from Aleppo named Hana Diab had come to him and told him these stories. The only problem is, uh, if you're a prominent Parisian writer of that time, your private diary was not really a private diary, right? There were no mentions of mistresses or, or salacious gossip. These private diaries were often, you know, I went to this Homer lecture, these are my thoughts on the Elysian marbles or things like that. And uh, they were possibly intended for posthumous publication. So scholars have assumed until very recently that the story about the storyteller was a fiction, that he was covering up, having made up the stories himself. I think somebody, did somebody say that? That he, had, he just made up his own stories, right? So, until very recently, there was an Oxford University Press book from about five, ten years ago. This was the, 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 the consensus in scholarship. This storyteller reference in his diary is probably just a ruse to cover up his own, his own fraud, basically. Uh, but, a la Dan Brown, in the Vatican Library, <laughs> missing the first five pages, what did I find but the memoir of Hanna Diab, a Maronite Christian from Aleppo, in fact, the first Arab travelogue of, of Paris, the first description by an Arab writer of going to Paris and wondering at its, at its marvels, right? Like the minaret of the Notre Dame Cathedral, to use, to use, this, uh, <laughs> to use this term. And lo and behold, in that, in that uh, previously unknown uh, uh, memoir, a travelogue, Book of Travels, he describes meeting an old man who was missing some stories of the Arabian Nights, and he describes giving him these stories of the Arabian Nights. Um, actually, he doesn't even say if they're from the Arabian Nights. He just said he was missing stories, he wanted stories for his Arabian Nights, and I told him some stories. So that's confirmation that, in fact, these stories that we thought were French inventions for 300 years, in fact, were at least Syrian French, 
they came, and in fact, in the diary, he writes, Hannah Diab came in and told me, and then there'll be like a six or seven page summary of the story, which then the, the French translator expanded to 40 pages or 90 pages. So now that we have Hannah Diab's memoir, we can actually give credit where it's due, and this, this sort of secret, secret uh, Syrian co-author of the Arabian Nights Tales can be revealed as the true author of Aladdin and the Wonderful Lamp and Ali Baba and the, and the 40 Thieves. Fabulous. So um, this is the plot, or this is you know kind of how the book really is, is grounded in what we're talking about unearthing. In a lot of my work, I really look at how do we reveal the concealed stories of our history, of our culture, in order to claim um, new narratives to push us forward, to change society. How are we looking at the way narrative is constructed and told and shared um, in order to reclaim the voices that don't often get um, the, the chair as the author, the, the credit. And so talk to me a little bit about um, some of your thoughts in, in both bringing these stories out, um, in also bringing out the stories and the complexity of each of the other translators that you talk about, because it starts with Galan and Diab, but we go into, throughout a number of, a few hundred years, different translators, their socio-political context, their own historical cultural context, why these stories suddenly became a reason for them to build their career, uh, do something to further uh, a project of their own. And you had said something really sweet to me over the phone when we were talking earlier that your father was a diplomat and that, um, I want to get your quote correct, so I'm going to look down here. And you see this work um, as an act of cultural diplomacy. So can you say more about how unearthing, uh, Diab unearthing the process of these translations is an act of cultural diplomacy? Yes, um, so I'll tell you a little bit more about Diab, the storyteller from, uh, from Aleppo. Um, he was actually the youngest of uh, four or five brothers uh, from a modest family with mercantile pretensions. All his older brothers got to apprentice with a French merchant in, Ale in Aleppo where he was from. Aleppo was a very important uh, crossway, it's a silk road, right, between the, the, the East and Europe. And uh, it looked like he would not get a chance to participate. Uh, because being, being the youngest, he would never get that stall in the marketplace and the bazaar where he could actually sell fabrics, right? Which I think is uh, fitting given Jaipur's uh, sponsorship of this, uh, of this festival. And uh, he actually joined um, a caravan where he met uh, an adventurer named Paul Lucas, who is like a bumbling uh, con man version of Indiana Jones, who, who basically. Uh, uh, saw Hannah. Hannah must have been a very handsome, you know, 17 or 18 year old, because he immediately wanted him to be an interpreter. Why Hannah? Why not somebody else? And Hannah joined him as a kind of servant slash interpreter. But immediately, Paul Lucas, uh, who was famous for destroying small pyramids because he was too impatient, uh, to, he, he wanted the, uh, the artifacts and to, and to go back and bring them to the court in Versailles, but he wasn't patient enough to go with a little brush. And uh, uh, so he literally destroyed little pyramids just to get some of the stuff inside. Uh, he saw in, in Hana a kind of oriental curiosity. He would bring back to the court, which he did. He presented Hana Diab dressed up in a kind of melange of not only Hana's Maronite robes, but uh, he asked Hana to wear an Egyptian headdress, which had nothing to do <laughs> with his heritage. And he presented him to the king in Versailles. And it's fascinating now that we have Hana's book to see this from Hana's um, perspective. Um, but what's interesting is that uh, even in discovering this memoir, I mean, some of the first scholarly conversations, uh, some French scholars said, well, this guy was a servant. How can you claim him as an author of anything? You know, and maybe he was giving the rudiments, the plot lines which Galan made into literature. So it, there's a bit of a, of a struggle to unearth. I know you're interested in the pedagogy of the oppressed, and as am I as a Brazilian, but uh, I really think we have to be careful when we're looking at the notion of authorship and not to erase the storytellers who told the stories collected by the Grimm brothers, right? As we know, a lot of them were female and had been erased from literary history and all the, all the credit went to the, the, the Grimm's brothers. And this is a very similar case. You know, uh, Richard Burton, when he applied for a knighthood, he staked his reputation, his literary reputation, as the translator of the Arabian Nights. He made no mention of the Munshis in Bombay where he, he, a lot of his commentary that he claimed was his 
was actually lifted from these notebooks that were a dictation from these Munchies and Mombeni, from his youth, right? So there's, we have a tendency to accept the authorship of these famous figures like Burton, or in the French case, Antoine Galland. And I'm trying to excavate and show the presence and the imprint of the, of the, uh, of the Munchies in Bombay, of the booksellers in Cairo, or in this case, the storyteller from, uh, from Aleppo. Just because he was a servant to Paul Lucas, the adventurer, doesn't mean he wasn't a, uh, a very talented storyteller in his own right. And the lovely thing about having his memoir is that he actually tells embedded stories. So he'll start, he'll start a chapter in his memoir of going to Paris, and he'll start it some, like, basically something like this, like, I found myself dragged by the police who were going to torture me because one of my friends uh, had gone missing with some valuable jewels. And then he'll say, and then I saw the, the, the cafetier, the owner of the first, first cafe in Paris. Oh, here's how I first met him. And then he'll tell that story. But wait, meanwhile, you're in suspense. Like, how, how do you get out of that fret of torture? You know, to your friend who disappeared with the jewels. So you can see in his own writing how he would have been such a, an articulate storyteller of Arabian Nights uh, tales. And the, this ability, if you've read, the, somebody mentioned the frame tale of Shahrazad. If you've read, it's almost like the film Inception, as a comparison my students are often, uh, often uh, uh, make, which is you have a story within a story within a story. And each story is in a suspense. So when you're free layers or dimensions into Inception or into an Arabian Nights tale, you're in suspense about all these, you know, will the, you know, will the, 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 the merchant be killed by the genie? Will Shahrazad be, Shahrazad be killed by Shariar, right? And all of that is in your, the back of your mind while you're working through the current uh, story. So, on, so Hana Diab, in his own memoir, had that ability to keep you in suspense and to juggle different stories at the same time, showing, in my mind, that we can't dismiss him as somebody who simply gave the, the plot or the rudiments or the outline to the, the French stylist, but that he was a stylist in his own right. He was a, a master writer in his own right, an author in his own right, and he should be recognized uh, as such. And I, that's, that's the kind of cosmopolitanism from below which really interests me as a, as a, as a scholar and as a writer, really. Um, we'll say more about this idea as we look at, um, again, that he was he was um, a traveler to France. He had, so he was looking upon France with these new eyes, yes. but also again in the context of these um, kind of colonial types who were trying to raise um, their profile and raise their careers by bringing back things from the East and kind of um, professing to be experts on these exotic or strange or different places. Um, yet his stories are, um, are slightly as an outsider looking at um, a culture, as an outsider looking at the morals that a culture uh, purports to, to live by, the values that a culture says, oh, this is, this is what we live by, um, yet in their day-to-day -day activity kind of really showing that these values aren't being lived out. And in fact, though, some, of the, some of the stories that he added are some of the most popular ones that That's get right. repeated over and over. I mean, if, if we think about the stories, I mean, it, is, is Aladdin, do you remember, was, is he a, a person of rank? Of privilege? No? Does anybody remember? Even in the movie, what, what is his status? Street 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 right? He's a riff Raff, as a Aladdin uh, uh, song uh, describes him. How about Alibaba? What, what was he? He was a woodcutter, cutting wood in the forest, you know, with his donkey when he overheard the thieves coming to the, to the cave, right, in the open sesame, right? So I guess he kind of stole from the thieves. We can think about the ethics of stealing from thieves. You know? <laughs> uh, but he only, according to the story, only st stole as, as much as he needed for him and his mom, right? So he's not, you know. But if you think about it, the most popular stories of the Arabian Nights in East or West, in, 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 in Mumbai or in London, in Panto or in Bollywood, there have been over 40 different Bollywood versions of them. <laughs> they all are attracted to these marginal figures, to the riffraff, to the woodcutter. And these are not the central figures of the original Arabic stories. The original Arabic stories most often are about merchants. There's even a colleague of mine who refers to the Arabian Nights in Arabic as the mirror for merchants. It's not the mirror for princes, it's a mirror for, for merchants. And in fact, when you look at the manuscripts uh, that have been preserved in Christian monasteries in, in Syria and Lebanon, uh, they're often collected. You find the Arabian Nights in the kind of mercantile literature section. <laughs> stories of merchants, about merchants, by merchants. So uh, Hanna Diab's stories that he contributed as a storyteller are, are uniquely 
the, from the perspective of really the outsider, the, the, the underclass, the people who have no claim to privilege or to wealth. And that makes them very unique within the canon of the Arabian Night stories. And I think it has something to do with their, their ling lingering appeal to us. Where we're, wa we're watching a panto, where now, you know, as you know, Hollywood is making, have you guys heard this? Hollywood is making a big Beauty and the Beast style live uh, action remake of Aladdin, which will be coming out now in, in 2019 in May. They pushed the Star Wars movie back for eight months and gave a <laughs> slot to this new Aladdin film. So these stories still, still interest us, and I think it has a lot to do with this uh, underdog uh, perspective. I mean, just to give you a sense, I, I love comparing the diaries. So um, the day that, that Hannah came and told the story of Aladdin, according to the diary of Antoine Galland, right? So you have this very sophisticated translator who is a classicist and knows Greek and Latin and likes to, rec likes to talk about how he, he reads Homer in the original and all that. The day he records in his diary that, that Hannah Diab came and told him the story of Aladdin, that day, there were riots in his neighborhood because of famine. There had been a horrible winter in 1709. People were starving in the streets. Does Antoine Galland make any reference to this in his diary? <laughs> no, zero. It's like it didn't happen. And you can imagine, if he was walking out in the marketplace, women had been killed, right? Women who had come from, from the interior of, of France to protest the, 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 fam you know, the famine in, in Paris. This was pre-revolutionary -revolu pre -pre uh, uh, Paris. When you read about the same time period in Hannah's perspective, that's all he talks about. The people starving in the streets, the, he has sympathy for the beggars. You, you weren't supposed to beg, it was against the law. Even soldiers who had lost limbs in battle were not supposed to be begging in front of Notre Dame Cathedral. You needed a special license from the archbishop. And Hannah even has sympathy for the condemned. He talks about these young people who were accused of crimes. They were paraded, they, they published these pamphlets about their crimes as they were about being led in the spectacle of their execution to some public square. And Hannah was wondering, well, does, does this young man really commit the, the crime that he was accused of? So it's a very different perspective that Hannah brought in his writing about Paris than the, the perspective of the elite that was soon to fall in the revolution about 70 years later. It's, it's fascinating, and that's what I mean by this kind of cosmopolitanism from below. As a servant, he frequented you know, of our servants, and he, he had that kind of uh, outsider's view of things. So when he talks about Aladdin dreaming of the princess and the palace, it is very much from that perspective that, uh, that we see uh, that story. I, I, I don't know, I, I, for me it's, it's, uh, it's uh, some, of the, some of these discoveries are mind-blowing. I mean, just to make one example, the palace, and the, do people remember Aladdin? That, that there was a, um, he falls in love with the princess. How can he win her love? Does anybody remember? What does he ask the genie to do? The genie of the lamp. How can he win over the princess, the daughter of a, of a fabulous king? Make himself look like a prince. Or That's right, right? And there's even a song in the, in the Disney, Prince Ali, you know, <laughs> the fabulous <laughs> king, <laughs> Ali Ababa, right? <laughs> but in the, in, the, in the story, as, as, as it exists in the French, uh, he asks the genie to build a palace worthy of his princess, right? And for 300 years, we have imagined that Antoine Galland made up this story. And since he had traveled as a cosmopolitan adventurer to the Levant, and he had lived in Istanbul as secretary to the ambassador, so what did we imagine this palace was based on, Aladdin's palace? Sorry? Yes, a Topkapi palace in Istanbul. Or some other oriental palace that the, 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 our fabulous French cosmopolitan had gone to. Never has it occurred to us that that other cosmopolitanism from below, that, that this servant from Aleppo had been presented in Versailles. And when we read uh, Hannah Diab's account of Versailles, this is much closer to the, the palace in Aladdin. He's drawing from his own personal experience. He got to hang out for a week in Versailles as a kind of curiosity. He got to engage these fabulous princesses, that were perhaps uh, the uh, inspiration for this idea that this riffraff could fall in love with a uh, with a royal princess. But most shockingly, some of the details, like the, the, the jewels and the order in which they're presented. So he'll say, a princess, she was wearing emerald and, and a, a diadem and, the same, uh, and a ruby. The same sequence of jewels in the same order shows up in his description of Versailles, of the princess in Versailles, and in these stories that were added by Galan to the Arabian Nights, like the, uh, Aladdin and the palaces and Prince Ahmad as well. 
And for 300 years we thought, that's Orientalism, that's a French guy just lavishing this fantasy of the Orient. And in fact, it's, it's an Arab Maronite <laughs> wondering at the wonders of Versailles, right? So it's, it's a, it flips the way we think about the book uh, completely. I noticed a hand going. Great, up. okay, so let's take a few questions um, and comments. So we'll take like four or five at the same time and then we'll discuss and then we'll take some more. What interests me also is again this idea of complicating history, complicating our social relations, complicating, again, the value systems that we think, you know, where do these ideas come from? Oh, it comes from here. Actually, no, it comes from here. Because our civilizations have always been in communication. Our civilizations have always been in conversation. There has not been a dominant thing that has traveled around or others have rallied around. Rather, it's adaptation. It, and there's something specifically about the language, and you can talk to that later, the language of Middle Arabic or something that yes. made these particular tales actually translatable yes. and transmissible, but we can, so hold that and I'll get a few others. Sure, sure. So let's go around and get some folks, uh, you had your hand up quite early, um, and then let's just go do, 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 around this way, yeah. So it's a two part question. One is, um, if there was only less than 300 of the original mother stories, um, did the translations, uh, they include Hannah's um, stories that were made of actually constitute the rest of the 1,000, I'm just trying to see, it. was that the only other source of the 1,001? That's part one. Part two was, uh, is Hana the actual originator of the stories, or did he in turn borrow them, just like thinking of the Grimm's tales, uh, you know, parallel? Is there over here? Um, I was interested in the uh, original premise of the, of the nights. Mm -hmm. So is it Arabic was version. here, yeah, I mean, yeah. The, the, the original, I, I'm yeah. reading the burden, so yeah. you know, okay. I don't know. But I'm just, the, the original premise is the wazir's daughter, Sherazad, is a brilliant storyteller and knows all the stories. Yeah. Is that the way it really is? I wanted to know also if he had, had collected these, whether they were old folk tales that he had just gathered. That's similar to my question as well as your um, second question. Beauty and the Beast, there are myriad versions from many, many cultures. Are there other versions of these stories, with the core of the story, the gestalt of it, that have come from other cultures, and was Hanna from Aleppo just you know, uh, synthesizing those, but really those core stories exist in many places? So we'll okay. take these, and then we'll do this side of the room. OK, so uh, 282 nights, actually only about 40 stories. Remember, Shahrazad couldn't tell a story a night. What would be wrong with telling one story a night? What happened if she actually finished the story? Well, she's playing the cliff Yeah, cliff Not a good strategy, right? <laughs> and in fact, this is true to the experience of storytellers in Aleppo. They, they, uh, they told stories in cafes. The manuscripts we find of the Arabian Nights have annotations for how to tell this story at a cafe. Change your voice now, do a woman's voice, now with sarcasm, now with irony, okay? But you had to Pause your story. We should do, try this at the at the Jaipur festival. You were supposed. You should pause your story at the most interesting moment, <laughs> and then ask for that donation to the Colorado. <laughs> <laughs> because that's what the, that's that's what they, they, they had to do. People would show up from all social classes for a price of coffee, right? And you, had, you literally they, they, there was this tradition. They would try and tackle the storyteller to force him to finish the story that night so they didn't have to come back the following day and pay for another coffee the following day. So anyway, so we have 40 stories about uh, each story for about five nights, right? So where did, uh, so the, your question was, um, was Hannah yeah. the only ever source, right? Um, Hannah the Up stories filled four volumes out of the 12 volumes in French. So basically, uh, for the French translation, yes. But in general, I would say, that the French were doing no more, to be honest, than the Arab booksellers have been doing for centuries. Because they only had 282 <laughs> authentic stories as well. And what do they do? They copy, and, well, like my undergraduate, no, sorry, they don't do <laughs> They copy and paste, they literally, their scribes copied uh, eight, 12 stories from other story collections, often in the same order as we find them in stories of trickster tales or other, other famous uh, collections and just transplanted them into the Arabian Nights. Now, does that mean that, that Hana was just a collector, which I think is, is, uh, is a, a question that was asked. Um, let me give you one example. I would say that Hana was more than that for the following reason. <coughs> story of Alibaba. Does anybody remember any of the elements of the story of Alibaba? What does it involve? I mentioned the beginning of the woodcutter cutting the wood and the... And he hiding in the trees and he got 
So there's a there's a, a 40 thieves, right? The horsemen. Then you have a magic cave full of wonders. And anything else? Does anybody remember one more element of Alibaba? The password. The password. The password. Sesame? Yes? Anything else? Is that the one with the big oil jars? The oil jars. And who kills the thieves hiding in the oil jars? Marjana, the slave girl, right? There's even a statue of this in Baghdad, right? Her pouring the oil, hot oil, and frying them. You know, alive. <laughs> so here's the deal. Yes, of course, uh, each element of that story exists separately in the oral tradition, and we can trace different manuscripts in the Arab world. But the clever slave girl motif, the magic mountain motif, uh, and the horseman motif existed separately. The first iteration of Alibaba that we know in recorded history is in the French translator's diary saying, Hana Diab came and told me this story. So there's a very good chance that Hana Diab may have been the first one to mix those elements in this way to tell a new story. So in that way, I think he is potentially a creator, not just a kind of a uh, recorder or compiler of the stories. I think that's the best example I can I could think of, of that. Maybe we should gather some more. I can see a lot of... The original. The original the, Arabic. Is, is it really, is it about Shahrazad knowing every story in, in in, in the book. It really is. I mean, there is a, um, in a story which originally, uh, um, King Shariar is, uh, as you probably know, his, he, he invites his younger brother to come and visit him. His younger brother forgets a gift. You can't arrive at, at the older brother, powerful king's uh, court without a gift. The younger brother goes home to get his gift in the middle of the night without announcing his presence. What, what does he find? His wife. His wife, oh, yeah. right, with a lowly cook. He seems to be offended more by the fact that it was a lowly cook, <laughs> you know. Yeah. But anyways, and then his, his younger brother then witnesses uh, in the palace where they think that he's now visiting his older brother, King Shariar, they think that they're going hunting, and Shah Zaman is too depressed because he was cuckolded, and he witnesses this orgy where King Shariar is cuckolded, right? And this massive orgy is on page two of the Arabian Nights. And my students are always surprised that there's an orgy on page two of the video. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but anyways, uh, so these men become very misogynist and paranoid about finding faithful women. And Shahrazad is fighting that misogyny and paranoid jealousy because Shariar resolves to do what? How does he handle this breakup, this woman cheating on him? Does anybody remember? Why, why do we have these 1001 nights? He wants, to, she wants to, he wants to marry a royal virgin every night Right and kill her early the next morning before she's had a chance to cheat on him. Yeah. So the only description we have of Shahrazad in Arabic is she was uh, she was wise and learned and she had read every book in the library. Interestingly enough, in the Arabic, no description of, of what she looks like. We don't know if she's tall, short, fat, slim. When what what has every single translation into French or English done? Does anybody care to guess with Shahrazad? Made her beautiful. Yeah. <laughs> the first thing the first fr French translator did is like, Shahrazad, with her amazing beauty, which kind of doesn't really explain why she survives. I mean, were all the royal virgins who were killed not beautiful? You know, and I think it takes away from her knowledge and the source of her power, which was distinctive, which was her storytelling, and her knowledge of all books, of science, of chemistry, of medicine, not just of, of stories, right? This is why she's such a powerful feminist icon and should be, right? But I, she was a vizier's daughter, and she volunteered to, uh, of course, uh, teaching in Abu Dhabi, I had the, the yes. grandson of the president in my class once, and he said, but well, politically, you can't, you know, the, 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 the caliph couldn't kill the vizier's daughter so easily. Oh. That's, why, that's why he had to give her a few nights, you know, to, <laughs> to tell her story. So that, that was a different perspective, you know, in terms of she his experience. She stories on behalf of her sister. Her, uh, her sister, uh, Shahrazad volunteers to marry uh, Shariar, to redeem the daughters of the kingdom, right? So she's got some kind of plan, maybe to kill him, I don't know. But uh, she asks that her sister come with her, and it's her sister who asks her to tell these stories, right, before they fall asleep, after they have sex. Her sister's like, oh, Shahrazad, those stories. <laughs> Start telling the story, otherwise, you know, this is our last night. So, yes. so let's go around, so um, raise your hands up high so I can just grab you, okay, one. One, two, three, four, five, six. So we'll do yeah, all of you. Mm -hmm. So 
these are really stories of the Silk Road, if they're brought by merchants mm -hmm. along the Silk Road. And then there's a lot of parallels with actual physical stuff, like the caves uh, on the Silk Road. You know, hot deserts, people, the place, the lodges are often in caves that are, are like houses built into the caves. Then I was wondering about like these caves that are like full of treasures, like in as far east as like Western China, you see these caves that are built, these temples that are built, and they're just very beautiful. Well, the ones that haven't been looted are just full of treasures. I was just wondering, in your research, did you come across like physical manifestations of the things in the stories? Excellent question. We were going over here, this row, one, two. So, uh, we're going to go from her down this way. Go ahead, Lady in Yellow. Yeah. Um, any book that's ever read to me, I only listen about the horses. <laughs> so when when you, I mean, that's not completely true, but it's enough. Um, so the horses of the knights are what fascinate me. And when you, the, when you perked up with Istanbul, they're decidedly not French. The way that they're worked with is not French. So I wonder if you could tell me anything more about them. Yes, sir. Uh, this people who ever get credit for the translation, how old are the oral stories? Mm -hmm. okay. I'd love to hear a little bit more about the finding of these memoirs that we surfacing with it, and also if it's been working. Sure. Mm -hmm. Okay. Wait, wait, you asked, I'm sorry, we have, we have a few who haven't had their voice up yet. Uh, two questions. One of them is, can you prove that the memoir was not written by Boreas? By <laughs> the library alone, to the library that you found that manuscript. <laughs> second of all, that's a lovely comment, by the way. <laughs> second of all, who is the author of this story here? Okay. In a room here, with you and everybody else in here, who has written that? The outer frame of that story. Who has written the meta? Who is the author of that? Story? Okay, let's integrate these into some more dialogue, and then we'll come back. So, I mean, to, to kind of uh, respond to some of these questions, an excellent question about the actual caves, right? Uh, uh, one of the moments that literally I, I had the you know, sort of hair standing on end, um, uh, nobody ever bothered reading the, the, um, the travelogues of Paul Lucas, this bumbling, pyramid exploding con man who didn't speak any languages but somehow collected manuscripts and uh, oriental languages, uh, who claimed to have found the elixir of life, the philosopher's stone. He's actually the, one of the uh, models for uh, Harry Potter and the Philosopher's Stone. They actually take something straight out of one of his, uh, one of his travelogues. And he was the most popular writer of travelogues of the Middle East uh, of his day. But because he was not an academic, we don't even, not even Edward Said condescended to write about him. So uh, he's kind of forgotten. And I was reading uh, uh, his travelogues, and, I, and I, then I realized that, that he has a whole incident outside of Aleppo in a cave dealing with this, uh, um, this local legend that there were these treasures hidden in the cave. And I was going, well, this is an incredible coincidence. Mm -hmm. And sure enough, in the memoir by Hanan Diab, the same story is there about Paul Lucas coming to him and saying, Let go, let's go outside the caves and show me these treasures, right? So you, and actual caves, right? So you can see how um, uh, Hanan Diab was under pressure by Paul Lucas to produce stories of, of treasures in caves, right? And there were actual caves that inspired these these, these stories. Um, speaking of horses, Paul Lucas in his diary writes of the actual horsemen bandits who threatened them between Aleppo and Damascus and between other points. So these were, and uh, funnily enough, at one point he claims he, he single-handedly fought 40 of them. <laughs> and there's even, he even has an illustration that I reproduce in my book, which I will sign, by the way, uh, for those of you who want afterwards. And this is lovely illustration uh, he, his servant is feeding him the bullets. He's shooting, <laughs> and you can see the, the remainder of his party running away, leaving Lucas to fight the 40 bandits by himself. <laughs> so the bandits on horseback. So there, there's, a, there's a basis in, in, in actual truth to, to these uh, stories. Okay, so the other, uh, the memoir, I am trying to get it translated. I've made a proposal to the Library of Arabic Literature, uh, which is out of NYU Abu Dhabi, so I have some sway there. And uh, they actually invited me uh, after having read my book, to uh, to uh, hire a translator and then get this project off the ground. So 
uh, inshallah, we will see. Uh, I mean, it's a fascinating document. Frankly, the, I think the Arabian Nights is one aspect of it. But the first Arab travelogue of, of Paris is fascinating. And I think it is much more interesting than just the connection to, uh, to the Arabian Nights. Uh, I think, though, I think those, those are primarily the questions. The, the, the oral stories, we know that they're at least, you know, in some cases, a thousand years old, right? And sometimes they, we just have the title of them and some, and some uh, uh, bookseller's uh, uh, list of stories he's heard in the markets of Istanbul or something like that. So sometimes we know the story was circulating, but the, the, the story is recorded for the first time 700 years later or something like that. Uh, so that's some questions right there. Time check. Okay. We might have to, I think we have time for some more questions. Good, yeah. Yeah. Um, and, and I think to speak to who's authoring this conversation, it really is all of us, right? The idea of knowledge production and knowledge creation um, is a, a thing that happens everywhere. You know, there are not only specialized people who create and produce knowledge, we produce and create knowledge in settings like this all the time. They don't always um, get documented and they don't always get referred to as authoritative knowledge. Um, but we are creating the knowledge. Our histories are here, present with us. Um, the information that we're carrying forward and synthesizing together is, is authoring this continuing conversation. Yeah, and I, I guess just to add a postscript to that, mm -hmm. I do talk about the, the first English translations of the Arabian Nights as well, and you know, famous figures like Richard Burton and, and Edward Lane. And I don't mean in any way to diminish uh, the accomplishment that they did. I mean, Burton traveled disguised as a Muslim to Mecca and performed the Hajj. Uh, Lane lived as a, in the Arab quarter as a native uh, in Cairo, and he refused to live as an Englishman and you know, with the badly matched uh, uh, image, imitation of the Ottoman dress that the English tourists had, right? Uh, it's just that I know, having found their notebooks and deciphered their handwriting, that when they are claiming to have this knowledge from having lived, from having traveled to Mecca or having uh, lived in Cairo, that they were actually relying on informants. Mm -hmm. And when you see in the notebook, you know, bookseller Sheikh Ahmad told me this, and then when it's published in the commentary to the Arabian Nights, it's published as Lane's insight, then, you know, the insight has been in a way stolen, and I think it's important to restore, especially because we can, with via research, mm -hmm. to restore, okay, actually that's from the commentary, much of that commentary from, was from the bookseller. Right, and Lane should have acknowledged that. And uh, even Burton, a genius at languages, spoke over 30 languages, you know. He claimed to have interpreted the sign language of the gorillas. <laughs> but again, if you, if you look at his, you know, almost indecipherable handwriting, uh, his early uh, uh, autobiographical writing, very clearly he relied on the Munshis in Mumbai for the insights that later show up as his philological insights, you know. Oh, this word cannot be translated. That, that, that would be verbatim something he took from a Munshe in Mumbai, and now it sounds like Burton is saying, from his knowledge of you know Marathi or something or Sindhi, the word can't be translated. So that's it's. I'm trying to restore both sides of the of the conversation because we've been only hearing about the the greatness of Burton, mm -hmm. the authorship of Galan. And it's also interesting. Who was anyone at the cultural appropriation conversation at this morning? Yeah. No, actually, I was going to bring it up. <laughs> yeah, exactly. And what's fascinating also that's in this book that you speak about is uh, during the times that these stories are being translated and being kind of brought back, they're really being sold. It's a capitalist enterprise. Um, people are gaining mm -hmm. money, gaining, yes. again, building their res uh, resumes based on this. And so um, the idea of cultural appropriation is really to say, you know, I'm the author, I'm the expert, hire me to do this, hire me to then write this book, that I'm making my career based yes. on the knowledge of other places um, that existed in other places and are known in other places, um, but it's not recognizing that as such, that only my eyes and the superior eyes of the European brain uh, exactly. can understand what's going on and bring it out in a cohesive way. Exactly. I, and, and this first translation of Yuri Renates uh, by the Frenchman Antoine Galland is a perfect example of this because his actual rivals for the first chair of Arabic at the university in Paris were Christian Maronites from the Arab world. And we now know, I mean, people who study Dutch Orientalism, Russian Orientalism, uh, Slovenian Orientalism, people traveled from other parts of Europe to Paris to talk to these Maronites. And that's actually why the, uh, these Maronite uh, uh, manuscripts, including this memoir now identified by Hamad Yab, made their way eventually to the Vatican Library because the Vatican Library and Paris, they all relied on these Maronite uh, figures as, as scholars of the Middle East. But Galan literally was competing with them and trying to write himself as a figure of authority. 
as opposed to people from the same community from which Hana came. Mm -hmm. Hana might have come from a more modest background, but there were educated Maronites, and Dutch Orientalists were hanging on their every word when they were writing their, their, their works of scholarship. Right? And it's interesting this idea that, again, the stories and the information by the people, of the people, then get, um, when you talk about appropriation, get, get held um, for others. You know? And you talk about this in some of the English translations, specifically around Torrens, yes. who is a colonial yes. um, administrator, um, but not the typical colonial administrator. And so he actually saw the value of um, language, Arabic, Persian, Urdu, um, for um, not only colonial education, but also for the education, the continued education of the people of yes. India. Um, and then the, how the 1001 Nights becomes this way that he can um, actually become an activist almost for the language of the people. Um, can you say a little bit about yes, that? Yes, I, I have a chapter which is about the first translation of the Arabian Nights from Arabic into English, not from French. There are many bootleg versions from the Galan's French in the 18th century. It was actually Henry Torrance, this completely obscure colonial officer in Calcutta. Nobody's heard of him. Um, uh, he was intricately involved in the first invasion of Afghanistan in 1848. Um, and what's interesting is that uh, Torrance um, and people like him were actually advocating against the use of English as a, as a, as a language of bureaucracy, against the replacement of Farsi with English. And they wanted to translate the Arabian Nights to to bring, um, actually, they wanted, what they really wanted to do was publish Arabian Nights in Arabic. But the colonial officers would only fund the publication in Arabic of the Arabian Nights if an English translation was produced. That's actually what happened. And I, I, I did some digging into Torres, and I was surprised because I, know enough, I knew nothing about the Freemasons. And he was a Mason, and he, was, uh, he established some lodges in India. He was a chief warden of a, of a Freemason lodge. And I thought, well, you know, this was some ho-ho or secret handshakes or some kind of Illuminati conspiracy. Here we go again with why people, why people think my book reminds me of Dan Brown. <laughs> but what's interesting is that it turns out that Torrance was um, an early advocate for opening up lodges to the locals. So most of the English believed the lodges should only be for Scotsmen and Englishmen. And Torrance and his friends wrote poems and wrote songs that they sung uh, about how they act. In fact, if you believe that we are all made from the same God, we all come from the same place, if these are the Masonic beliefs. And he actually founded newspapers in India. He was the founder of the first newspaper in northern India. And he believed that Indian journalists would be a check on colonial authority. And he was an early patron of Anglo-Indian novelists writing in English. So the story is much more complex and nuanced than simply, oh, these, these English translators and adventurers, they are the authors. In fact, they were always relying, Torrance himself relied on a team of munshis who did most of the work of editing in Arabic and interpreting words which allowed him to translate into English. And that labor, I think, tends to be lost and lost over. And all we're left with is a sort of series, as in the Bohes essay on the translators of the Arabian Nights, we're only left with these famous European translators and not the pe people whose labor upon they, they, uh, they depended. But in that way also, Torrens is like an ancestor to the Jaipur Literature Festival, <laughs> looking at promoting Anglo and Indian uh, authorship and, 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 and cooperation. Yeah. Yeah. So, yeah. And very interesting, to you said the Masonic Lodges, they opened up the Masonic Lodges to Indians, to um, indigenous folks. And then who are the people who come out of the Masonic Lodges? Oh, yes, lodges? we should mention, I mean, if you look at uh, 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 Nehru's uh, uh, father, right, or the whole generation before independence, all of the independence leaders, their parents were, were members of Masonic lodges, right? So there's a direct connection between the opening of these lodges to Indians to the movement for independence, which is not surprising when you read Harry Tor Torrance in 1835 saying, we need to have a free press in India as a check against colonial authority. The logical extension of that is self-government, right? So it's, it's interesting to see, again, it's not what you expect, if you just read, you know, trolls on the internet, or, or your notion of the Illuminati comes from uh, Hollywood movies, you know. But the, the the Masons had a much more positive role in Indian nationalism and uh, and uh, decolonization than than one might uh, imagine. So an active resistance in the translation. So let's go around. So one uh, up there, two, three, four, and then we'll do you last. I'd say that uh, yes, the Masonic lodge was open to people, but at first it was only open to the elite. In yes. The yes. And uh, maybe there was a tendency to be more pro British and yet try to bring out India from, free from colonialism. 
But this was pre so this was the fathers, the grandfathers of those independents. And they were all so they kind of elite and the lodges were never open to the common man till after independence. And okay. that made a big difference. And I just want to make mm -hmm. one part about having said what you said, I think the amalgamation of Western thought and Hannah's books, I have to reread these nights so that I get a better perspective on the book. And read his book. Yes, that's okay. <laughs> Was Shahrazad real, and how do we know that she was? Sir. Um, this is back to the extension of the cultural appropriation discussion. Uh -huh. So we talked mostly about Hanan Diab and, of course, the Maramites. Uh, but you're mentioning these Bombay Munshis. Mm -hmm. um, I didn't hear any references. Are there any things you've come across in your research that actually document writings by these Munshis, and I would have expected they would have written in Farsi and not in Arabic. Mm -hmm. Is there any reference to that? Because so far the connection has been pretty much uh, in Syria and others, but not further east. Yes, sir. I have a question about fables. These stories are possibly fables, and I was thinking about the discussion of the Silk Road. You know, we know that there are deep connections between European folklore and Indian folklore to Panchatantra. A lot of those stories overlap with the green stories. Those are fables, so they have a decidedly didactic mm -hmm. moral component to them. You mentioned the anecdote about Ali Baba only taking what he needed. Mm -hmm. right? So I was just wondering if in the Arabic tradition, any of these stories played the role of didactic fables mm -hmm. or whether they were just good yarns. And our last question comes up. Well, Shahrazad is obviously the heroine, I think, of the story overall. But story and her salvation from what I understand is based on the ability to be educated and so I wonder in terms of current times in Arab countries how popular are these stories still and do girls have access to them and how does that jive with their difficulty in getting education? Okay. Well. Five minutes. <laughs> <laughs> Not even sure as I do. Uh, okay. That's, uh, well, That's it. Exactly. <laughs> Here we go. Um, but wait, should we pass the hat first? <laughs> right, exactly. Right. Well, we'll, we'll pass it around and we'll sign the book. Um, okay, with Shahrazad real, we know that uh, the names Shahrazad, Shariar, Shazaman are Persian, and, and there is some speculation that the original uh, frame tale of Shahrazad uh, might have been based on a historical event. So that's, that's unfortunately, we don't have the, 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 either the historical document or the, or the Persian story, the frame story in Persian. Um, but uh, the original core, I, I think I mentioned the 40 stories that make up the 282, night, 282 nights. Mm -hmm. It is possible some Arabists speculate they have a consistency of style that there was one author behind them all. So in a way, there's a kind of real life Shahrazad behind those stories, right? In the same way that the stories that Khanna contributes have a certain Khanna quality to them. They're about outsiders, young boys like him, adolescents like him. So, um, the, so there is a reality to, to, uh, to her, I think. The, um, I should have explained, my, my book is written in seven chapters. Each chap chapter can be read independently. I did that on purpose, so you can kind of pick it up and read a 30-page chapter without having to, uh, to read it all at once. Um, and the first two chapters are about Hanadiya and the stories he contributes, but then I move on. And Han uh, Henry Torrance translating the Arabian Nights for the first time from Arabic into English in India, and who he borrowed from. And the last two chapters are about the famous Richard Burton. So we do know that uh, uh, a Munshi he studied with in, in Mumbai did write his own books on, on, on linguistics. Burton was actually very condescending towards those books that he wrote. But the irony here is he was borrowing directly from these books that he mocked in his autobiography. Mm -hmm. But if I go into his notebooks, whoops, cutting and pasting from the very Munshi book that he's making fun of, right? So, so yeah, that, that's in my... Um, that's in my Burton chapter, if, uh, if you will. I'm trying to remember what else was. Somebody asked me about fables, right? Um, now, it, there's a certain paradox, because uh, remember, we're just talking about the frame night. Uh, there's a, an orgy. There are a lot of women cheating on these kings, right? In fact, there's even a woman who's kept by these two kings. What do they do? They go out on a, on a quest to find an honest woman. Do people know what happened? A uh, uh, huge uh, cloud appears, it, it crystallizes in the form of a gigantic djinn. He keeps the bride, that is a teenage bride, he's kept. 
He stole on her wedding night, uh, which gin tend to do. Spoiler alert, they like to steal brides on their wedding night. Gins marry, and some of them are good and perform the hajj. Some of them are not so good. Um, this you should know, but uh, he, he, keeps, uh, he keeps his, his genie bride under seven locks and seven chests in the bottom of the sea. And uh, the king see this gin, they, fr they, f they flee onto a, a tree. Uh, as soon as the gin comes out, he falls asleep. And she asks, she, fakes him out. she, she asks uh, the, the kings to come down and sleep with her, right? Yeah. And in one version, which Burton likes, of course, the, the younger brother says, you first. <laughs> You're the older brother. And at, then she collects her, her uh, their seal rings, and she says, and she brings out this bag, according to Burton, there are 578. In the Arabic, there are only 78 rings. But anyways, there are a lot of rings, seal rings, of all these powerful men she slept with and cheated on this powerful jinn, right? So a lot of the stories don't actually match the didacticism that you would expect. And the closest we can generalize is that in many cases, the appeal of the story was in the transgression, right? The woman fooling the man, the upending of social convention and hierarchy. But when they got written down, often the scribe felt obliged to add a moral. And the moral doesn't always fit the story very well. You know? <laughs> so it's a story about stealing or, or you know, an orgy, and that's why people pay attention to them and pay their, their coffee and buy my book or whatever the case may be. And then there's a moral, and the moral doesn't, doesn't always sort of fit particularly well. I don't know if I missed one of the questions. But, uh... Women reading it today. Women. Ah, yes. Well, I, I have the chance to, to I teach in I actually moved to the Middle East uh, partly to write this book because I thought it would be a better place to find the sources uh, in Arabic and other uh, languages with which to tell the story of these overlooked co-authors, which turned out to be true. I mean, if you're living in the region, it's much easier to, uh, to suss things out. Um, but I have to say, in, uh, in the Emirates where I live, 68% of the undergraduate students at the local universities, not at New York University where, where I teach, but at Sheikh, at Sheikh Zayed University are women. So there is a big uh, educational push, which doubtless has immediate effects, like the marriage contracts, which are drawn up now, uh, tend to give women much more um, autonomy in terms of pursuing their careers and their further education, their masters, and things like that. So there is a um, on the ground uh, positive element to uh, to the story, as, as you say about you know our women reading. Uh, fortunately, at least in, in countries like the Emirates, and I think much of elsewhere in the, in the Arab world. I don't want to necessarily generalize about every single country. Um, but the, ed, I think the education is ahead of other political rights, and in a way it's kind of pulling the political rights along, right? Once women are graduating from college and getting better uh, autonomy vis-a-vis -vis their marriages and more right to divorce and things like that, then the, the laws change. Um, it used to be if a, a Emirati, Emirati woman married a non-Emirati, she would lose her citizenship. And just recently that's changed. Now she keeps her citizenship, so do her kids, so does her foreign husband. So I think education is key to this. If I, if I had to uh, contribute to a foundation uh, uh, in terms of charity, it would be uh, women's education. Um, I think it's very important. I feel good to be part of that.